Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate the presence of each and every one. We don't ever know what all you've gone through today, what trouble you've been through to get here, but we're glad you've come, and we've got a good crowd, and we hope that as we study tonight, you might open your Bible and turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We're going to begin now a segment in this little book written to these brethren who had been converted in this town of F- city of Ephesus and become Christians and begin to face all the trials and challenges that anybody would face. And what we're going to see tonight is we've been looking at what God has done. We've seen, first of all, that God planned this church in the very beginning. Jesus came and purchased the church with his own blood. The Holy Spirit finally came when Jesus went back to heaven and put a seal on this church as a down payment, an earnest, and a guarantee that it all, it's not going to stop till it gets finished where God intended for it to finish. And then we notice how again, as we look on in the book of Ephesians, that again God is brought to the forefront in the second chapter after a prayer is prayed. This prayer for us to have the insight to see it right. And then we see the second chapter begins by showing us what we have done. Is we all, we, we've been dead in trespass and sin because we, we walked according to the course of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. When we all once had our conversation living in the lust of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath even as others. And so the writer reminds us that what has happened is that God has saved us by grace. But he saved us by grace through faith. Now, we can never earn. There's nothing we can ever do, never do, to deserve or to earn the grace that God has demonstrated by sending his son to the cross. But we are obligated by faith to believe what God said and to obey what God has told us to do. And so those two things together have got to work together. It's got to be grace and it's got to be faith. It can't be grace only and it can't be faith only. Those two have got to run together so that we will be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God before ordained that we should walk in those good works which he he ordained before the world began. And then the writer paints a picture of how dark it was before we became Christians. Being without Christ, without God, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, having no hope and without God in the world. And the apostle tells these Gentiles, these outcasts, don't you ever forget that you remember that as long as you live and then he breaks out into the praise of what jesus has done for us again so we see again the father's put on the scene in the second chapter then the son is seen as one the father has by his grace and love and mercy and kindness he has drawn us and reconciled us to each other or to himself and then in the latter part of the second chapter of Ephesians, he's showing that what Jesus did in the power of the cross is he made the thing that would make us all become one body, one group of people, just like we sung, just like we sung. The mystery of it all is that God would save everybody the same way, in the same body, by the same plan, and there would be no respecter of persons and no other way to do it. And so if we're not humble enough to do what God said, there's no imaginable way that we can be saved. And so the writer shows us that Jesus has torn down the wall of partition between us and he's destroyed and abolished the enmity of the spirit of an enemy so that we could all be reconciled. We could be brought back together and peace could be made between us if we will let him tear the walls down and destroy the spirit of an enemy and not have any prejudices. And, and special judgments about because we're educated, we don't like people that are not. Or because we're, we're handsome, we don't like people that are ugly. Or because we have money, we don't like people who don't have money. Or uh, we live in the north or the south. Or we have black skin or white skin. It doesn't matter. We need to love every individual like God does. And look at every man that he has the stamp of God on him. He's made in the image of God. And I tell you, men can make a mess. But we still bear the image of God and we need to be like God. And look at this world so we can influence it and love it and have impact upon it. And so the writer tells us that's exactly what Jesus did and what we should do today. We spend our time looking at the third chapter about this revelation that God has given. Paul said he wrote in few words. Whereby when we read, have you ever thought about the fact this little testament I'm holding in my hand is 320 pages. If you were to ask me, how do I get to heaven? And write me in, write in a book how to get it done. 
Well, by the time I got finished, you'd have to go to the library and read through volumes of books. I'd have made it so confusing you'd have never figured it out. But Paul said he wrote in few words, whereby when you read, read what? You read the few words. When you read those few words, you can understand Paul's knowledge and the mystery that God planned to save the whole world, bringing us all together into this one body. It was not made known to other angel, uh, ages. Angels couldn't see it, you see. The prophets of the Old Testament, they couldn't see it. But guess what? God has revealed it to us. I've said many times about when my grandmother died. I thought I knew my grandmother pretty well. But when my grandmother died, after she was gone, my mother, who knew her a lot longer than I did, told me so many things and explained so many things to me about my grandmother that I thought I knew. And so we see that what we're doing today is we might think, if I could have lived back in the days of the apostles, oh, that would have been the day, let me tell you. We have got complete and total insight into everything we can see. God clearly, because we can see Jesus, because the inspiring uh, the Spirit has inspired these men to tell us everything we need to know. Now, there are a lot of things we want to know we didn't tell us, but we don't have to worry about that. And so the writer paints the picture of this great revelation being given, how we should always go back to it, trust it, rely upon it, put our confidence in it, because it's the way, it's the roadmap, it's the way to be right and to have access with God. And so he tells us in the latter part of the third chapter, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, unto him be glory throughout all ages, world without end. And where is this to be done? In the church. The only way we can glorify God is to find the church. Now, what if you were to lose your car? I told about a lady losing her car in the parking lot, finding it with the keys. She thought she found the right one until she realized the keys couldn't open the trunk. If you were to lose your car, you might go out there and find... My wife and I came out of the hotel the other day. We walked up to a car we thought was our car, and I kept punching the button, and the door wouldn't unlock. And I said, what in the world? The battery must be dead in this thing. And I kept punching it and trying to handle the door. And I'm glad nobody was looking out the window because we looked like a couple of idiots trying to get in the wrong car. I, she said, oh, look, our car's over there. Well, we went over there and punched the button and the key opened the door, you see. That's the way this church is. Jesus gave the apostle Peter and the other apostles the, the ability, the keys, what they would bind on earth had already been bound in heaven. And so they had the keys, and today we have got the same keys today. And so the fourth chapter begins by telling us now the application. Somebody has said, you can teach all the principles in the world you want to preach, and teach, but until you have some application, it's kind of like kissing your cousin. There's no benefit to it. So we need to have some application now. And the writer is going to show us the conclusions have got to be strong in our mind so that we might now see what our responsibility is. And notice the challenge that God gives us at the very beginning of the application of this little letter. In the fourth chapter in verse 1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, notice something here. In the next few verses, we're going to talk about some unifying facts, some truths some principles that we need to respect and we, we need to value. But before we come to that, God wants us to see that what we've got to see, first of all, is we've got to give constant application since God has done so much to establish this church, to build it and to maintain it and to help it to grow and to keep it throughout time. Since God has done so much to it, what we've got to do now is we've got to determine, are we going to walk worthy of what he's called us to? I, I've told the story many times about a man I read about years ago and uh, he was riding on a train up in New York City talking on the cell phone. He was in the bathroom area and the phone rocked, uh, the, the train rocked and he dropped his cell phone in the commode. It was a very expensive phone so he reached in there quick to grab it out before it got out of sight and 
he got down in there and got to reaching and got his arm hung in the commode. Why, he started screaming and hollering and carrying on. Well, the conductor came and said, what's going on? He said, I got my arm stung and I can't get out of here. They had to stop that train on the track and bring in a group of men to come in there and dismantle that thing to get his arm out of there. They had to stop the trains coming the other direction So because of the crossways. They had to stop, stop subways. They had to stop all sorts of things. It cost New York City a million and a half dollars for that man to stick his hand in that commode. Now, let me tell you something about Christians. We think, well, I can do something that I won't bother anybody. I'm a Christian, but I can go out here and commit adultery or lie or gossip and do something, and I won't be hurting anybody. Let me tell you, you will hurt all of us. You will hurt the Lord. You will hurt your brethren. You will hurt your family. You will hurt your influence. You will hurt the church in every way. So let's see, good people, that God is calling upon us to stand up now because of what he has done and let us walk worthy. Let's let our conduct and our manner of life be worthy of what God has called us to. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every brother was faithful and committed and careful about what they did, always thinking that some way, if we're not careful, we can harm the church that God loves so much. We can be destructive to it if we're not careful. And so let's walk in a manner, the apostle says, in the job or the occupation or the vocation wherewith God has called us. Now, what is that? First of all, he says, with all lowliness. That just means to have a a proper opinion of your own smallness. Don't think too much about yourself. The apostle Paul said in the third chapter that he was less than the least of all saints. And many times I tell people, I'm a nobody. I don't have any education. I'm the most unschooled, unskilled. I probably have the lowest IQ. He said, don't talk like that. Listen, that's the truth about it. And I'm not embarrassed or ashamed about it. Because let me tell you, if there's any value to me, it is because of what God has done through the gospel, not because of what I've accomplished. And so if we can always have a low, a proper opinion about who we are and not think too much about ourselves, too many times male ego gets in the way. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, shows that quite clearly. And also, sometimes female ego can get in the way. But we need to see, good people, that what God wants is for people to have a proper opinion about their smallness. And then he says with meekness, and that's just the idea of gentleness, mildness. Uh, It's it's the word described of a horse. I told about my wife years ago. We rode in Louisville, Kentucky. There used to be a bridle path in the the city out in the south end, and and we'd ride these horses down this bridle path in the city, and my wife was always afraid to pull on the reins. Oh, it's going to hurt the horse's teeth. And so the horse would get over in somebody's yard and start eating her tulips and get up in the yard and and start doing things. They said, get that horse out of the yard. I said, baby girl, just pull on the reins. I said, the horse is all his powers under control. You won't hurt him. Just pull him. He'll come over. I'd have to go up there and get hold of him, pull him and guide him over, get back on the track, and then there she'd go off again, see. But you see, we've got to get rain in our mind and control our body, our tongue, our eyes, our hands, our feet. We've got to be people who know what it's like to be gentle, self-control, and to behave yourself when you want to blow your top. That's what God's calling us to. And not only does he ask of us to be meek, but he says with long-suffering, and I tell people whenever you find a long word, sometimes cut it in two, put the first part at the front, and and the last part at the front, and you'll find the definition. Long-suffering means to suffer long. That's what you do. You're patient with people. When people do things to upset you, how do you respond to that? You control yourself, and you have patience. You're long-suffering. You don't blow your top and get upset when somebody mistreats you. I've I've said quite often that statement in the book of Isaiah when the Bible described Jesus giving his beard to those who pulled it out and giving his back to those who beat him and gave his face to those who spit upon him. Can you serve when you're being humiliated and beaten and crucified? Jesus could. Why could he do it? Because he was long-suffering. And so the apostle is calling us to have this kind of disposition of mind, to look at ourselves in this kind of a way. 
and to forbear one another in love. Now, what does that mean? Well, take the last part, put it over again. And it means to bear for somebody. When somebody's got something they can't bear and they're overloaded, do you have the sense to see I need to not stand back and criticize them, not stand back and point the finger at them. I need to see if I can help them to lift their load. The Pharisees were good about piling it on and not taking their little finger to even help to lift the load. Sometimes we've got that spirit, I'm afraid. We need to bear for one another and to help each other in love. This is what the Lord is calling us to. And while we're doing that, he says to endeavor, which means to constantly apply yourself, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I've told about my older son, John, years ago, I I might have mentioned there was an open dump in the city of Madison for years, and the boys and I would take a load over in our old pickup truck. We would dump it off, and finally my wife got to forbidding us to go over because we'd bring two loads back when we went, you know. And we saw a two-seater bicycle out there one day, and John said, Dad, look over. I said, go get it quick before somebody else sees it. We loaded that two-seater bicycle up, took it home, painted it up, put pinstripes on it, put some new tires on it, and shined it up. I said, John, let's get this thing going down the street here toward the school and let's open the gate up and see how wide it'll go. Let's just see what the gate is on this thing. So I was in the front, and so I started pedaling as hard as I could go. And old John was behind me. He was about about 10 years old. He was was pretty strong, but not like me. And so we got to going down for good. I said, John, I'm not a gambler, man, but I said, I'll buy you a Coca-Cola if you can take off and pass me. Well, now, he's kin to his mama, so he starts jerking on the handlebars back there, acting like he's trying to come around me, you know. He said, well, Dad, I'm not a gambling man either, but I'll buy you a Coke if you can take off and leave me. (laughs) But let me tell you something. I was strong, and he was weak. But it was not about him passing me and not about me running off and leaving him. We were having to pedal together to get there. Will we ever get that into our head? Somebody's weak, we don't try to help them. We try to run off and leave them. Or we get to thinking we're strong and we try to run past somebody else. No. Let's do this together. That's what God's calling us to. That's the challenge that is so high for us. The endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. That is what the Spirit has told us to do and to be. In the bond, the glue, you see, of peace. Trying to get along. You think God wants us to fight all the time? Be in an uproar all the time? He wants us to find peace together as we work together. If we can't find that something's wrong with our disposition, we've got to try to find that somehow. But then notice he says in verse 4, he then brings us to these seven unifying facts. But notice what's amazing about the facts. If you were going to make up a list of what's important to God and you were thinking about all the things you could think about, would you think that the Church would be the first thing that God would put on the list? Why is the Holy Spirit doing that? Well, what do you think this book is about? He's trying to get our attention to see he knows what our trouble is. We don't have too much trouble understanding there's one God or that there's one Spirit or that there's one faith and one hope or one baptism. Our struggle is we're going to tear this thing up and make two out of it. We can't understand that God wants us to work to stay together and to value the fact that there is one body. There's just one church. That's all there is. And if we can be humble enough to figure out how in the world can all, and I said to you, imagine Jews and Gentiles. Can you imagine what went on in their Bible classes? Things that must have been said. I told about when I was a boy, my grandpa obeyed the gospel in his old age, and I went to church with him one time, and I was sitting down there in the, in the building. They didn't have classes for kids. It was out in the country. And this preacher got up and was preaching, and one old boy said, Ah, preacher, you're dead wrong about that. I'll tell you, you don't know anything, you ignoramus. And an old boy said, No, nah, I'll tell you, you're ignorant yourself over there. I know what I'm talking about. And I told grandpa, I said, I scooted down the seat like that because I thought in a few minutes, these old boys are going to break out in a fight. I'm going to get down low before I get hurt. I got down low. I want to get out of the sea. We went outside, and I said, Grandpa, what in the world? 
was wrong with those men. They were about to get into a fight. He said, Hoss, he called me Hoss Sly all the time. He said, I was always flying around. He said, Hoss Sly, they weren't going to get in a fight. I said, what do you mean? They was hollering back and forth. He said, don't you know they're farmers? They get out on a farm, they holler at their hogs, they holler at their cows, they holler at their chickens, and they go to church and they holler at each other. Well, let me tell you, go home and holler at your hogs and cows and chickens. But don't come into this house and have that kind of a disposition of mind. This is God's house. Let's know how to behave in it. And let's see, good people, that God has put this at the beginning of his list. So when you think about tearing it up, when you think about trying to divide it some way, you better think long and hard about what God will do to you. We better learn how to get along. I always tell folks, if you think you can go to heaven by sitting in this building and being mad at somebody for 20, 30, 40 years, if I know anything about God, if you get to heaven, God's going to put you in a duplex and they're going to live upstairs, you're going to live downstairs, and that's the way it's going to be in eternity. You're going to get over it. You might as well learn to do it now. If we want to love God, we've got to love each other. And the writer says, after listing those seven facts about there being one, one way of being cleansed, one Lord and Master, one revealer, one guide to tell us what we need to know and to do, one faith which comes by hearing the Word of God, all these principles of one God and Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit, and then this one body. He says to us then in verse 7, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that which, now, now that, now that he descended, ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He descended, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill or fulfill all things. And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Now this is a, a statement taken from Psalm 68 verse 18. And if you've ever read that psalm, you'll know it's a picture of somebody uh, the prophets foretold of who would, the, the marvel and the amazement of how far they would come from up where they were so high and to come down so low and go into the, uh, the, uh, the, the under parts of the earth to go into the principle of the Old Testament shows of going into death and then coming up from death and going all the way back up and going Beyond the heavens, how far Jesus, do you realize how far he must have come to get off the throne of the universe and to come down here and be made and fashioned and found like a man and then not only to live among us and be mistreated, but finally to be crucified and to die a death, not just to die, but the death of the cross and to be put in the tomb. And those Jews and old Satan and all the people who hated Jesus, they thought they had a victory day when they put him in a tomb. But let me tell you, they didn't know Sunday was coming. Every time Sunday comes, I think about that. Jesus was resurrected and ascended back to the throne of God on high. Set on the throne. How far did he come? And because of him being a victorious king, he, like all kings, would go down the road when he had taken spoils from his enemy. And all his people would come out and welcome him back home. He would throw spoils out on the road, throw gifts out to people along the way. Now, what are these gifts? They're tools to do the work that God planned from the beginning of the world. And so we see these prophets these, these inspired teachers, these apostles who were special credentials, with special credentials to go out and witness to what they had seen. These inspired men going out and teaching. And then we see pastors who are shepherds, overseers, who are to feed the flock. And then we see teachers who probably, like in Acts 13, we find at Antioch, they were prophets and teachers, which meant some were inspired and some were just men who 
who got what they had by perspiration. Some got it by inspiration. Some got it by perspiration. They studied, you see. And so here were these pastors and teachers. And what was the purpose of these five tools that God gave? You know, I tell people, you can understand the work that God wants you to do by the tools he gave to us. I was out with some men one time cutting firewood, and we brought all this wood in. I called my wife. I said, honey, I forgot to bring my split maw. Bring my split maw out to Tom's. Well, she pulls up out there in a little while while all those men out there around the wood pile. She opens up the back door of the car, throws a sledgehammer out on the ground, and drove off. Well, those old boys got to chuckling. They said, boy, your wife either thinks you're awful strong or awful stupid. Think you can split wood with a sledgehammer. Well, you can't split wood with a sledgehammer. You've got to have a split maw. You've got to have some wedges. And when we think that we've got to have tools like gymnasiums and, and places to eat and things to do for fun and food and frolic, we don't know the work that God has given us to do. The tools tell us what we better be doing. And what are we trying to do, verse 12? It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints, for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God onto this perfect man. We're trying to get everybody to grow up and be like Christ. You know what our trouble is? we got some doing it and some not. And when you've got some people growing and studying and being strong and some being weak, you know what you'll have? You'll always have division because there will be problems with people that don't see it right and don't understand it, and don't live by it. But if every individual says, okay, preacher, and I tell folks everywhere I go, I'm always just looking for one person. I don't care who you are. I want somebody here to get stirred up and excited about this so much so that you just set this place on fire. People start saying, what's wrong with that person? They're having Bible studies and want to teach classes, and they want to have a Bible study in my home and talk to my neighbors. What's happened to that person? They've got excited about what God wants them to be excited about. And if we could ever get excited about teaching, now you can't teach if you don't know something. If you don't read your Bible and study, you can't do it. And I'm afraid that sometimes is what the trouble is. We just don't know our Bible like we used to. You all heard the old story I know years ago about a courtroom didn't have a Bible. And so the judge said, well, if there's a member of the church of Christ, come up here and just lay your hand on him because the Bible's in all of them. Well, guess what? It ought to be in all of us. But it takes a lifetime. One old boy, somebody said, I'd give 40 years of my life to know the Bible like you. He said, that's just what it took. There's no shortcut to it, people. We've got to get back to it. We've got to love the gospel. We've got to study. We've got to grow up. And so when the writer tells us that we're perfecting these saints so that they notice for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, what is the body? It's the church. You mean to tell me that you are supposed to be doing something? I thought it was the elder's job. I thought the preacher's supposed to do that. You mean I'm supposed to? Let me tell you, every individual's got to bring something. And I tell you what I have learned this week. I don't know whether you've intended or not, but you all have helped me tremendously. I mean, you all talk not. I've been preaching the same place 38 years. Hardly a member ever says a word about my lessons because they've listened to me so long they're tired of it. And you people have just talked to me like I'm really doing something. I don't know what you're talking about. But you've helped me because you've come and you have built me up. And I hope that I've come and in my little shallow way, maybe I've built you up. But we all need to come in those doors with a mind. I'm going to find somebody. I'm going to say something to somebody. Now, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to shake somebody's hand, hug them, tell them how much I love them. I might kiss them on top of the head and tell them they mean the world to me and God bless you. I'm getting encouragement because you're here. Old people and young people. I thought about my grandpa obeyed the gospel uh, when he was 69. I held a meeting where he attended when he was 80, uh, 87 years old and he drove to the meeting house. And people told me, said, now when you go out after services, when your grandpa, pulled, when Thelbert pulls off in his car, get in the building because he can't hear. He revs the car all the way up and jerks her in driving and throws rocks at everybody. That he shouldn't be on the road. When he stepped up there in the door, had his glasses on, he stepped up there and looked at me face to face. He said, is my grandson here? I said, is he a handsome looking fella? He said, he sure is. I said, you're talking to him. 
he had eaten chicken and rubbed the grease all over his glasses. <laughs> and when I was preaching, he sat there, and when they sang the songs, he never sang the same song we were singing. <laughs> he couldn't hear anything. And when I was preaching, he had a big old watch. I'd give it to my, my oldest son, big old rabbit killer. You remember them old railroad watches? He had that big old watch. And while I was preaching, he got that thing out after about 15 minutes, and he pecked on the seat with it. He held it up there to remind me that's just about enough. <laughs> he went to the back. He said, I don't know why I come. He said, I don't know any of these people. I don't know what in the world songs are singing. I can't hear the preaching. He said, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, let me tell you, Grandpa, you're doing more than you'll ever know. It may not be helping you, but it will carry me a long way. I'll never forget it. You see, you don't know what you're doing sometimes. But if we can all see We've got to build this thing up. We've got to get involved. In, we can't just sit and say, I wonder why it's not growing. We've got to grow spiritually so we can do other things. And when every member gets stirred up about it, oh, Satan better get off the highway because here we come. Because that's what God wants us to do. And so the writer says, till we all come in the unity of faith, and let me tell you, we will never do it in time. We had a man preach in Madison he obeyed the gospel. We got 22 men to preach where I am. They don't need me, and I don't tell them that. But uh, this one man had been converted. He got up and preached a sermon. Well, he made a mistake in his sermon, and one of the elders got up after him and said, Now, Brother Gary did a good job, but he made a little mistake, and I want to correct that. Well, this young brother got upset about that, and he went to the back, went out and slammed the door, and went home. And so one of the elders called me. I was away in the meeting. He said, Boy, Gary preached this uh, morning, and he made a little mistake, and I corrected him, and he got mad and left. I said, I'll take care of it. So I called Gary. I said, Gary, what happened to the old buddy? He said, oh, I preached a sermon. I made a mistake. And one of the elders got up and embarrassed me and cracked me in front of everybody. I said, well, son, is that the first time you ever made a mistake? He said, why, well, no. I said, do you think you're not going to make any more mistakes? He said, why, well, no. I said, then get back over and tell them you're sorry and get at it. He said, that's what I'll do. But, you know, we all going to make mistakes. We're going to get off the track. We're going to bump into each other. These verses show we're going to mishandle each other. But we've got to get over it. We've got to grow up. We've got to be like Jesus. What did he do? How did he respond? Till we come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, the complete mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're after, good people that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of, do the, the, by every wind of doctrine, the slot of men, and cunning crafters whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Can you see the negative side? Can you see the danger? There are people who will deceive us. We can be deceived if we don't study our Bible. And he says, here's what we need to do, but in contrast to that, but speak the truth. Notice, speak. Speak the truth. But speak the truth in love. Don't act like you're trying to chew somebody's head off. Act like you care about somebody. May grow up in him into all things, which is the head, even Christ. Christ is the one who's dictating and, and governing, controlling things that are here. He's the head of the church. For whom the whole body, notice every member of the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted with that which every joint supplies, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making the increase of the body on the edifying of itself in love. Here's a picture of things being compacted and put together. I was telling somebody not at the supper table, but I took a tent to India with Tom Moody and I years ago. I had a two-man dome tent, and we set up on top of a school building, went in into it with a lantern to kind of go to bed. And we didn't know that these Indians up on the hillsides around us saw that tent with a lantern in it, and they thought it was a spaceship, and they came down there, ran out of school, and about, had about 400 people around there worshiping that tent. Down below, we heard an uproar. And so the preachers came and said, you can't stand here. There's going to probably be a riot breakout. They think you're from outer space. <laughs> and so uh, they said, you're going to have to go sleep in somebody's house somewhere. So we said, okay. So we left. And so these preachers, we had a bunch of preachers. They said, well, could we use your tent? I said, Sure. And so I, I went to bed and got up next morning, come up there, and I looked at my tent. I got up on the roof, and my tent was about that tall. It looked like somebody broke all the, all the uh, aluminum rods in it. And I thought, what in the world happened to my tent? They're fiberglass rods. And so 
I got over and unzipped it, and I got to look, and there was an elbow over here and a foot over there and a head over there. There were 22 Indians sleeping in my two-man tent <laughs> trying to get away from the mosquitoes and trying to get away from the cold. But let me tell you, they were compacted together. They did that because they wanted everybody to be away from the mosquitoes and away from the cold. They didn't care how tight it was or how hot it might get. They cared about each other. Good people, we have got to get beyond our pride and our arrogance, our divisive spirits, our high-mindedness that I know everything and nobody else knows anything. I, I sent a young man to preach to a place one time, and a man called me after a couple years and said, Did you send this young boy? I said, Yes, sir. He said, He's an ignoramus. Why did you send him over here? I said, You just wait a couple more years. I said, he'll study and he'll be a know-it-all just like you and you'll both get along just fine. <laughs> Some of us think we're a know-it-all. And we don't have any patience for somebody to know what we know. It's crazy. We're growing at different levels, at different speeds. And the writer tells us in these verses that these every individual, every part has got to do its part for the edifying of itself in love. And then he paints this picture in verse 17 of what we ought to be. How we should walk, not as Gentiles walked, in the vanity of their mind. And he tells us that when what they do and what these outcasts had done in the past, they were, they were walking in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, that's their condition, alienated from the, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because the blindness of the petrified, the hardness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, shameless conduct, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If you want to live ungodly, let me tell you, you didn't learn that from Christ. That's not what he wanted. You haven't learned that from him. If so be, he says, that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful deeds, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's a picture of somebody taking this old man and killing the old man and being, rising up out of the water grave baptism and being something new. There was a lady in Madison her husband was a drunk and a drug addict, and she came to church one Sunday night, and she said, well, my husband, he did it today. He got high on drugs, and, and he had a seizure and passed out. And I said, well, Reba, what did you do? And Re Reba was a lot like me. She was not educated, not very smart, and sometimes she, she tried to use terms that were too big for her like I sometimes do. She said, I gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth suffocation. <laughs> Let me tell you what some of us do. We kill that old man. He goes down to the water grave of baptism, and, and he comes up out of the water grave of baptism. He puts on these new garments, and that's the way to do it. Don't put on new garments over a dirty man. You've got to get that old man cleaned up first, or you'll ruin them new garments. But what we do is we end up giving that, new, that old man mouth-to-mouth -mouth suffocation. We try to bring him back to life again. Let's kill that old man. Let's don't let him live anymore. Let's get rid of him. And the writer says in verse 10, he lists the catalog of what we ought to get rid of. Wherefore, put away lying. Every man speak the truth with his, uh, with his neighbor. We are members one of another. So let's tell the truth with each other. Let's don't destroy each other by lying to one another. Be angry and sin not and let the sun go down your wrath. You've got 12 hours to get over being mad about something. Neither give place. Don't let the devil use your mind like a hotel. Don't give him any room. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the things which are good that, it might, that, that he might have to give to them that, that, that have need. I, 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 I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and as a young boy, I ran around with people who were criminals and did a lot of bad things. My mama ran off when I was a boy, and I just went crazy for a period of my life. It's a wonder I'm not in prison today. One of my friends was stealing a transmission out of a car one night, and he, he, a car pulled up behind where he was working there, and he told his buddy who was with him, he said, give me a 
nine sixteenths. And he reached his hand out to get it, and he looked in his hand, and the policeman had put a badge in his hand. He said, come out from under there, son. So he got out from under there. He said, you're under arrest. You're going to go downtown. So they took him down there. And he said, you're going to do public service. And since you know a lot about cars, they found out he knew how to make cars really run. He said, you come down here every Saturday, and you work on these police cars and, and, and work on them and do things and fix them up. So he said, okay, I'll do it. So he went down there every Saturday, worked on those police cars. And he'd been out stealing things all along before that. And finally, he got some money made up. He got his service, got put in, and the police department hired him, started paying him. He became friends with a policeman. He became an honorable fellow, and he went out and bought him some rims and new tires to put on his car. He came over to house and showed them to him. I said, man, those are sharp. He drove home that night and parked it out in front of his house. He got up the next morning and come out. Somebody had cleaned him out. He called me, and he said, man, I hate a thief. Why did he hate a thief? Because he worked with his own hand. That's what will make you hate a thief. And when somebody lies about you, that will make you hate a liar like God does. When somebody's angry and can't control themselves and they go crazy, you'll see the danger of that and you won't want to be that way. But my friend, do it because God asked you to do it. That's the reason why. And then the writer says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, that's, that's the ideal of uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 15, of somebody letting some corruption, some root of bitterness spring up, and, and that can defile everybody. I read years ago about a man riding on a train, and uh, he uh, had a buddy who was with him who was a prankster, and this old boy went to sleep on a train. He did what people do when I'm preaching. His head went back and his mouth come open. And his old buddy had some quinine water with him. That's a real bitter water they used to have. And this old boy dripped some of that quinine water down that boy's tongue. When that got down there to his tonsils, he got to taste it, and he jumped up and started squalling, and the conductor came and said, what in the world's going on? No boy said, I don't know what happened. He said, I went to sleep and I think my gallbladder busted. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, some of us have let our gallbladder bust. We're bitter. We're bitter about everything. Don't let that be who you are. And wrath which is sudden outburst, and anger, which is somebody who's slow and sulks, and clamoring, which is somebody who harps and gripes all the time, and evil speaking, which is abusive language, be put from you with all malice. That's ill will. Let's get rid of it. And be ye kind one to another, or be gracious and tenderhearted to have compassion and forgive, that's to pardon and to rescue people that have wronged you. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's a tall order, I'm here to tell you. That's the challenge that we've got to reach up to. What will this church be if just one person decides, I'm taking the challenge, God. I'm going to step up and I'm going to be what you want me to be. What if two or three decide? What if, what if half of us decide, hey, we're tired of fooling around here. We're going to get at this. Well, you know what will happen? They'll have to tear this building down. We'll have to meet on a mountain over there somewhere. There won't be enough room for people. If we ever get excited about it and take the challenge to walk the way God has called us to walk. If you're here tonight and need to obey the gospel, can you see what you need to do? Come with a confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Have a desire to change your will. Be baptized so your sins can be washed away and rise up out of that water and kill that old man and become a new creature. Why don't you do it now while we sing the song and encourage you?